Thank you very much for having me. I'm really happy to be here in Lincoln just to have a conversation with you about some of the stuff that we've been learning um, around doing innovation within large companies and also within startups. And so the, the thoughts I'm going to share with you today is stuff that's been kind of percolating and evolving in my head as I've been doing the work and kind of seeing when things break and things don't work so well. Because I actually do remember a time when it was really hard to have a conversation with innovation teams and startups. It was really, really hard to convince them that they were actually working on a project that had uncertainty in it. Like, that was a really hard conversation to have. Most of the time, people were interested in just the innovation theater part of it. So you can see the stage there set for you. You've got the MacBooks, you've got the bean bags, you've got the sticky notes. You can't have an innovation lab that doesn't have sticky notes, because you can't innovate without sticky notes. So with all of that theater, the practice was still very traditional and still very linear. Because I remember once I was in South Africa working with one of the largest banks there, and I was having a kind of this like heated argument with one of the founders of one of the innovation teams. And they, were, and they were saying to me like over and over again, listen, man, my idea is already validated. And, I, and, I say, and, I, and then I'll speak to them again, and then they'll say it again, like, my idea is already validated. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, because I had to stop for a second. You've said that three times now. What does it mean? What do you mean when you say your idea is already validated? And he said to me, my idea is validated because it's been approved by the board. Great. I was like, okay. Is that like a blessing from the Pope or something? Like, that's not the same kind of validation that we're talking about. Now, of course, over time, those conversations have gotten a lot easier. You know, with the advent of the business model canvas, lean startup, and all of these things, it's now easier to have these conversations with teams. Teams are now much more willing to engage with design thinking and agile, and much more willing to engage with this whole idea that you build, measure, and learn. Right? You don't just execute on your ideas, you test, you test your riskiest assumptions. And you do this using the Lean Startup Toolbox. So we're all now familiar with the Lean Startup Toolbox. We've got A-B testing, we've got landing pages, we've got all these experiments that people are now running. And the point of running these experiments is to find out whether or not your idea works. Okay, so you find all the things that might make your idea fail, you identify them, and then you run experiments to test these things. So that's a really important step, right? Because that's something that you absolutely must do. But what's interesting about that is that running experiments has sometimes made things worse, right? So teams are running experiments, but they're actually more confused now, right? They run experiments, they run experiments, they run loads of experiments. Some teams even have a process where they go like, we have experiment velocity. We run like one experiment a week, right? And so they're running all these experiments, but they still feel like they're spinning their wheels. They feel like they're kind of just staying in, in, in place. They've learned a lot, but they still can't answer the question of how close they are to success. How close are you to finding a business model that actually works? They can't answer that question. They're just running experiments and running experiments and running experiments and testing their ideas. And so what, what's interesting about that is that experimentation is a necessary condition for innovation, but it is not the absolute sufficient condition, right? You, you have to experiment to make progress. It's a necessary but insufficient condition for success. So you run experiments, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna be successful straight away. And the reason why this has been a problem, teams are running experiments and running experiments, is that people haven't realized that there's a whole other thing around I innovation, right? The other thing is that even though you identify uncertainty, uncertainty is not the only thing that drives success. You also have to deal with nonlinear process, the fact that it's not a linear process. You also have to deal with complex systems thinking. Right? It's really, really complex systems thinking. And so rather than making it a linear process, it's kind of chaotic. So for example, imagine you're a team that's working on your idea. So you go do the thing where it's like, what, is, what problem are you solving? Go talk to customers. So you say, okay, we're gonna do an experiment. We're gonna go out into the world and we're gonna to talk to customers. So you go out there and you talk to customers. And then you learn that customers are not interested in the, in, the, in the offering that you have. So now you have choices to make. What do you do with that learning? Do you change your customer segment? Or do you stick with the same customer segment and change your value proposition? Right? Now, it sounds like you've only got to make those two choices, but actually, each of those choices leads to a series of other choices. If you change your customer segment, now you have to think about the channels for reaching the new customer segment you've just chosen, what kind of relationships you want to build with them, where you're going to find them, how you're going to have a conversation with them, who are they? So 
making that one choice has flipped things over. If you decide to change the value proposition, now you have to think about how are you going to make this thing? What are the activities you need to be good at? What are the resources you need? How much is it going to cost? And it's all complex systems thinking. A lot of the myth-making around experimentation is that when you run an experiment, you're going to find something out that will allow you to make a quick decision straight away. And that's not really what actually happens. And so the conversation I want to have with you right now is, is a bit of um, fun-making about the stuff that we do as a lean startup sort of design thinking movement. So just, just go with me for a second. So we all agree. Does anybody disagree with me that innovation is nonlinear. If you disagree that innovation is nonlinear, you have to leave the building. Because <laughs> right. innovation is nonlinear. It's not a linear process. So in order to deal with some of these problems, here's what we've been doing, because we work in large companies, right? We say to people, if you have an idea, okay, what you want to do is to follow these steps. The first thing you want to solve for is problem solution fit. And then the next thing you want to solve for is Product market fit. And then the next thing you want to solve for is business model fit. Okay. You've all seen this before, right? Somewhere. Problem, solution, business model, like this whole linear thing, right? And it's like, that's not how this works. This is not how innovation works at all, right? Innovation is a nonlinear process. And somehow, we've tried to map these linear steps onto this process as if that's how it works. So we keep telling teams, focus on the problem, then focus on the product, and then focus on the business model. That's not how it works. We all know that's not how it works. And what this leads to is something that I call the brutality of the lean startup coach, or the brutality of the agile coach. Have you ever been in one of those conversations where you're having a conversation with an agile coach and they keep asking you, what problem are you solving? What problem are you solving? What problem are you solving? Who's your customer? Who's your customer? What problem are you solving? And then you say, yeah, you know, we understand the customer. We understand the problem we're solving. We've been out there talking to them. And then they go, no, you haven't done the problem research enough. Go and figure out what problem you're solving. Or you get another coach, because sometimes people are getting coached by different people, right? The other, the other coach comes in and goes, you map your business model canvas, and you identify your riskiest assumption, and then you start working on your riskiest assumption. OK, so now I'm a team. Somebody's telling me, work on your riskiest assumption, and somebody's who's telling me, you have to start with a problem. That's the brutality of the lean startup coach. Because what happens if your riskiest assumption is whether or not you have the capabilities to create the product? Like, what if that's your riskiest assumption? Are you allowed to start there? No, you have to go find out what the problem is. That's the brutality of the lean startup coach. What if your riskiest assumption is do we get key partners? Is there anybody to help us? We can't do this by ourselves. Is there anybody who can help us to do this? No. You have to go talk to customers to find out what the problem is. And then, here's another thing. Like, I've never seen any entrepreneur in my whole life, any great entrepreneur, that does this one sticky note at a time. Like, who is to say that you can't do all these things in parallel? You can't figure out what customers need. You can't figure out whether you have capabilities. And you can't figure out who the key partners are all at the same time. No, don't do anything else, go find out what the problem is. That's the brutality of the lean startup coach. And I've been a victim of this myself, actually. When I was at Pearson, the award-winning model that Brian was just talking about was called the lean product life cycle. And this is the lean product life cycle. And what we did was we, we told teams, you generate your ideas, and then you go out there and explore if customers have the need, and then only after you found out where the customers have the need, you then validate the business model, and then only then can you scale. All right? Now, here's what used to happen to us all the time. So we knew that it was a nonlinear process, so we made it a cycle like this to try and hide the fact that it's really a straight line. <laughs> so <laughs> we're like, yeah, man, it's, you know, it's, it's a loop. <laughs> It's just a straight line. And so what used to happen is teams would always ask us, do you always start at idea? Right? And, and so after being asked that question several times, we thought, no, 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 no. You don't always start at idea. You can start anywhere. And, and so we, we revised our own visual and made this. Lines everywhere. 
And all we're trying to do is illustrate the fact that you can start anywhere and you can go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. It's a non-linear process. What we're trying to do is trying to visualize this. Right? That's what we're trying to do. Here's another example. I found this on one of those design thinking. I just Google design thinking and you on the images and you find this, right? So the first thing they did was they drew the linear process, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, implement. Like as if when you're implementing, you don't empathize and define and I, like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, that's weird, right? Okay, so when you prototype, you don't empathize or ideate? That, it, Right, so then they go, oh, okay, yeah, actually you have all these arrows that go back and forth, so you can do one thing and at the same time do the other thing, and when you're, when you're at implement, you can go back to empathize. But then if you're at implement, can you go back to prototype? Right, and what we're trying to do is visualize this. That's the challenge that we're facing. And then of course, there's my favorites, these doozies, right? So these ones are even worse because they say things that are completely absurd. So like, for example, during this part, you do only design thinking. And then during this part, you do only lean UX. And then during this part, you do only agile. Like, that's totally absurd. It is not true at all. Like, these are practices that just flow across the whole thing. And then, of course, the thing goes back, and it loops like this, and then it loops backwards, and then it goes back to the beginning, and it's like, what? Right? And all we're trying to do is visualize this. That's what people are trying to do. We work in companies that are so used to having linear processes, that we're so used to drawing things that are linear, right? And linear processes are like your drunk uncle. You can't invite them to the wedding, but you must invite them to the wedding, so you invite them to the wedding, and then they're your drunk uncle, because they're always there doing drunk uncle stuff. So we bring linear processes into a non-linear process. I remember having a conversation last night, actually, and it's like people who do this have to be comfortable with ambiguity. So if you draw for them a linear process, they go, yeah, in week one, we're going to do problem. And then in week two, we're going to do solution. And then in week three, we're going to do business model. You have seen, probably in your organizations, accelerator programs that do this. They tell their people that the first four weeks are just about the problem. And then the next eight weeks are about making the solution. And then the next six months are about scaling. Right? And that's just like, that's not how it works. Like, that's, it's just not how it works. And we know it. And we kind of start force, forcing our teams to do things that are not the right things for them to do for the innovation stage they're in. Right? So we need to be really thinking about this. So here's one way I've thought about framing it. It's this concept called the wicked problem. Right? Now, innovation is a wicked problem, and the idea of a wicked problem is, it, it, is not something new. It was written by a couple of social, social scientists that I'll just show you just now, but it, wicked problems are different from hard or complex problems. Wicked problems are a distinct class of problem, which is when you touch one thing, the other thing changes, it's, it's all a bit chaotic, right? It's really hard to specify and hard to, to define. And this concept was first introduced into the lexicon by these two academics, I think they're from Berkeley University in California. And they introduced the whole idea, and they were talking about the dilemma of social planning or, or city planning, where they say, like, when you're doing town planning or, or city planning, you're dealing with a wicked problem. Like, you, you think that you're doing one thing, and then you have these unintended consequences, so it just becomes complex. It's, it's a non-linear thing. You don't know what the effects are going to be for some of the things that you actually do, right? And then a lot of people have also started talking about strategy as a wicked problem as well. And I think innovation is very well framed as a wicked problem. That framing actually works. So a wicked problem is something that's hard to specify. It doesn't have a single best solution. It's complex because the requirements keep changing and shifting. All right. And I think this is a good way to actually think about it. So let's go through like... They, Ritual and Verba, they list like 10 characteristics of what makes wicked problems. I've got like four that are kind of related to innovation because I wasn't going to go through all 10 and drive you crazy. So the first one is, there's no definitive formulation of a wicked problem. And that's the same thing we face when we're dealing with innovation. So as much as we tell our teams, you must go out there in the world and find out what the customer problem is, even if we do that and we run those experiments, we only have a partial understanding of exactly what the problem is, right? 
I've seen like different teams go out to try and solve the same problem, if, if, if you want to call it that, come up with different formulations of it, and actually come up with two distinct products that actually work and have impact on the, mar on the, on the, on the market. So you cannot define it, like have a definitive formulation to say, this is the problem that we're going to solve. You kind of have a vague understanding of it. And because you don't have a definitive problem, solutions to wicked problems are not true or false. It's not a mathematical formula, right? It either works or it doesn't. And that's what we're trying to figure out when we're doing these projects. So sometimes you hear teams asking you, how do I know exactly when I'm ready to scale? It's like, you don't. It's a judgment call, right? It's sort of part art, part science, because there is no true or false answer. It's not like you're trying to solve a, defin a, a defined formula. And then another one is wicked problems do not have a finite set of potential solutions, because it's a wicked problem. You, there's no finite set. Like, you think you have it figured out, you've got this great product, and then like two years later, some other startup comes up with something better and kills you. And then that startup gets killed by somebody else. And then that startup gets, it's just an ongoing thing. So there's no definitive, collect like, you're never done. Right? And that's what's interesting about it, which, which is that wicked problems have no stopping rule. Right? I've worked with startups that thought they were ready to scale, and then they started scaling their product, and the process of scaling broke everything. They thought they found something that works, and then when they tried to scale it, it breaks everything. Right? So you're constantly trying to figure these things out. And that's why I'm opposed to the notion that when you're scaling, you stop doing design thinking or lean UX. Or when you're scaling, you stop experimenting, because scaling itself is actually a test of your business model. And that's something you have to be thinking about constantly. So one way to think about it, right, is to think of innovation as a bag of puzzles, a bag of puzzle pieces. It is as if somebody gave you a bag of puzzle pieces, but they didn't give you a picture to solve the puzzle with. They just gave you the bag. No picture, just the bag, full of puzzle pieces. In addition to that, there are puzzle pieces in the bag that have nothing to do with the puzzle that you're trying to solve. Uh-oh. My mic's gone dead. Can you hear me still? OK, good. Ah, oh, hey, I'm back. All right, awesome. You must be one of those guys that drew those circular things, switch me off. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's as if somebody gave you a bag of puzzles, right? You don't have a picture. And inside the bag are puzzle pieces that have nothing to do with the puzzle you're trying to solve. What are, what are some of these pieces? That's when people are constantly telling you to do stuff that's not relevant for your business model. You work with a coach, they tell you you need to have social media strategy. And it's like, or well, people that try and sell me SEO optimization. Like, I'm a consultant. Like, people don't look for me by Googling innovation consultant and then take the first person that comes up. But people are trying to always sell me SEO optimizations for my name. These are all, that's all like the puzzle pieces, the noise that's inside the bag that has nothing to do with the problem that you're trying to solve. And then you do the work, you do the work, and just when you think you've figured something out, the next puzzle piece you solve breaks everything else. Like, oh, we thought we already figured it out, but now we've learned this, and this has got nothing to do with it. It's like, yeah, customers loved it, but they're not willing to pay. Oh. <laughs> and, and then you got to go back, right? So it's a whole bunch of chaos going on, back and forth, back and forth, and then you run out of money. All right. And so this is the way to formulate and think about wicked problems, right? There's so many moving parts, and, and, and you have to think about it. But the cool thing about business in general is that even though it's, it's a wicked problem, it's also got a really basic ontology, it's got like a basic sort of structure. It's only like a few things that you have to think about. Even though they're like interconnected and they move and, and everything, it's just a few things. So one way to manage a, a wicked problem is to go one level of abstraction, because teams are always in the weeds with the project they're working on. But if you go just one level up in terms of abstraction, you can really start to think, OK, how do we start to solve this particular wicked problem? And in this case, I strongly believe that innovation is really defined by this question, which is, how close are we to finding a business model that works? So when you're coaching an innovation team, that's really what you're asking for. They're not just doing experiments for the sake of doing experiments, right? And if you're in a context where you're not testing business models, maybe the question is, how close are you to delivering the impact that you want to have in the world, right? So that's really the fundamental question. So you need to be able to measure and track this, or at least be able to assess this in some sort of way. And so from our point of view as strategizer, we believe that there's four questions that you have to ask teams when they're working on their projects. The first one is a feasibility question, which is, can this be done? 
That's, the, that's one layer on the ontology. The next one is, should this be done? Even if it can be done, should it be done at all? Do customers want it if we found the right channels, et cetera, et cetera? And then the next question is, can it be done profitably? Right, which is the viability question. And then finally, can this be done at scale? Now, I only told that in a linear way for storytelling purposes only. It doesn't mean that you start with feasibility, then you go to desirability, then you go to viability and adapt. I had to put them in some sort of order in terms of telling the story. But that's not how you actually do the work. And so, how do you then start to do the work? Well, here's how you start, okay? You don't walk into, if you're a coach, you don't just walk in there and go, you need to go look at the problem, okay? You have to actually meet the team where they are. Start with where the team is, okay? So start with where you are. And how you start with where you are is, I, I took this from uh, Eric Reese's um, uh, The Startup Way, okay? So you, what, you ask the team, what assets do you currently have? What have you actually done? What have you created, right? And then you ask them two other questions. What have you done to increase the likelihood of success so far? And then the other question is, what have you done to increase the magnitude of success so far? Okay. Now, how do we know what they've done to increase the likelihood of success or the magnitude of success? Have you guys, you, you guys, in England we have the Dragon's Den. I think here you have something called Shark Tank or something like that. Right, so on Shark Tank, there's always a guy who comes on there and goes, yeah, I've got this dog bone thing, and I'm going to sell it because it brushes the dog's teeth, and there's over 5 billion dogs in the world, and if we get 2% of that market, we're going to be rich. Yay. And then there's always the question they ask, which is, have you had any conversations with any distributors? Have you spoken to any retailers? And they're asking that specific question because they want to find out what you've done to increase the likelihood of success and perhaps the magnitude of success. That's why they're asking you that question. So that's what we want to know when we're working with innovation teams. We want to know what they've done to increase the likelihood and the magnitude of success. So in order to do that, it's strategized that we created this thing we call the Innovation Project Scorecard. It's free. You can just Google Innovation Project Scorecard, and you can download it for, for free. And so what we do is we use this to benchmark where the team is right now. Okay? So we ask them a whole bunch of questions. So let's look at the questions that they have to respond to. Um, for example, we focus on desirability, and we ask them questions about their customer segments, their value propositions, their channels, and their customer relationships, right? So stuff like our value proposition resonates with our critical customer segments. But I want you to look at the scoring, okay? The scoring is not whether or not you feel strongly in your opinion that you've done this work, but whether you've actually got evidence from experimentation. But what we've done now is we haven't told people just go do an experiment. We have framed the result of the experiment in a way that allows them to measure the progress they're making towards finding a business model that works. Right. The next one is feasibility. Right. Can we create this product? Do we have the right technologies, the right channels, the right partners? The next one is viability. You know, what have we done so far to show that our customers are willing to pay and how much they're willing to pay and how much it will cost us to create the value proposition? And then finally, adaptability, which is about scaling, right? Do we understand our competitive landscape? Do we understand the key trends? What, what evidence have we collected to show that we understand this? And we're just benchmarking this with the team, right? And then finally, if you're in a large organization, we also care about strategic fit, because a lot of people are working on stuff that their companies will never scale, because it doesn't fit the strategy of their organization. And so we care that they're working with key sponsors and key stakeholders and just aligning with the company that they work with. And then, of course, what is the size, what is the potential size of the opportunity, right? And this is data you can collect as you're running your experiments. Okay, so one day, I was in the Netherlands, and I was working with an innovation lab that had nine, ten ideas that they were working on. And they were arguing about which of those ideas they were going to scale. So I got frustrated, and I stood up, and I drew these six lines on the board. And I was like, OK, we're going to have a conversation, and you're going to score your own ideas on how much evidence you have for this. How much evidence do you have for strategic fit? And then we'll score it. How much evidence do you have for desirability? We'll score that. How much evidence do you have for feasibility? We'll score that. How much evidence? Viability, adaptability, and what is the size of the opportunity? Right? And we did this for all of their ideas. And you could, this is starting where you are. So the job of the innovation leader is to figure out where the team is and then help them make decisions about what to do next. 
It is not to come in there with a linear process based on a timeline and go, no matter what you've done so far, you are here, and then you're going to go here, and then you're going to go here. Because that then breaks everything, right? So you're trying to figure out where they are. So this is one team. Another team might have some sort of market signal that they've discovered, and they understand the market, but they don't really have anything else in terms of value proposition. Another team might have a really great technological discovery breakthrough, but they don't have anything else figured out. Right? I've even worked with teams that are actually out there making money at scale, but they're struggling because they don't really understand why their customers buy the product. That's a, that's a true story. And it's like, okay, well, what do you tell them? Where are they? What stage are they in? Right? They're making money already, so what stage are they? Are they in problem stage still? Right? And that's what shows that this is a really non-linear process, okay? And so you benchmark where the teams are. And then, after you benchmark where they are, they start doing the work. You help them figure out what they need to do, and then you track progress after every sprint, after every sort of period of work that they're doing, you then track the progress that they're making. And for that, we've created this sprint report that teams can use. So you kind of have them capture whatever they're working on in terms of value proposition in the middle. But then you ask them a few critical questions that are really important. The first question is, what have we done in the last period? Okay. And what have we learned during that period? And then, this is the more important question, which is what we still don't know and what we plan to do next. Right. For me, the critical question is that one what we still don't know, which is, again, on the basis of the scorecard, we still haven't figured out our channels, we still haven't figured out our pricing, we still haven't figured out. So you can help teams benchmark what they still don't know versus what they've done and what they've learned. And as you capture these learnings, you can actually go back to the scorecard and update the progress they're making. So the way you know that a team is making progress is if they keep scoring higher and higher on each of these dimensions every time you have a conversation with them, right? But you're doing everything in parallel. You're not picking one thing over another and picking another thing over another. You're just working on what is the riskiest and most important assumption for them to work on right now at this very moment. Okay. And so by doing this, I actually think that we might be able to figure out this chaos because at least it allows us to track progress and do things at the same time and really kind of work in a way that helps the teams really make really great decisions. And so it's not about running experiments. That's the key takeaway. It's about using those experiments to make progress. And the progress we make will be nonlinear, but we can actually track that if we manage to measure and benchmark and track those things at the same time. And what I'm speaking about here is in a book that I'm going to be publishing with Sense and Respond Press. Whenever you get a moment, go check out my boy Josh over there. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for having me. <laughs>